Why in the world was Boeing kicked out of the competition to replace the current doomsday planes? The United States Air Force urgently wants to replace their 747 Doomsday fleet and the only planes that could realistically do so are more 747s, just newer ones. But just the other week, Boeing dropped a bombshell when they confirmed that they had been eliminated from the competition completely. So how is that possible? And if Boeing can't provide these jets, then who can? Stay tuned. So to start off with, what are these 747 doomsday planes anyway? Well, I, I really hope that you like acronyms and code names because military programs tend to be absolutely full of them. And that also includes the aircraft that we will be looking at today, the Boeing E-4B Nightwatch. Now, some of you might be wondering, why am I even doing a video on this? It's clearly a military aircraft and I normally only cover commercial aviation. Well, the answer, on top of the fact that I love everything that has to do with the Queen of the Skies, is that this story gives us a really good insight into how Boeing are doing right now and how they plan to look after themselves in the near future. Now, I'll get back to that part later, but first, let's have a look at a little background to all of this. The Boeing E-4 Bravos are part of a program called the National Emergency Airborne Command Post, or NEACP, but you might have heard of it simply referred to as NECAP. As the acronym suggests, NECAP aircraft are meant to operate as mobile command posts in case a war, more specifically a nuclear war, takes out the normal ground-based command infrastructure. The idea is that whatever happens, even if another country would accomplish a first nuclear strike, the United States still will have the ability to deliver a retaliatory strike on the attacker from basically anywhere. Now, you might have heard of a good old idea called nuclear deterrence via mutually assured destruction, and well, this aircraft is basically the admin work behind that concept. In order to have the ability to deliver this retaliatory strike, the NECAP aircraft have communication systems that allow them to speak with, well, basically any communication network there is, be it in the air, on land, on the surface of the sea, or even under the surface. You could think of them as probably the world's most comprehensive, advanced, and potentially gruesome call centers. Of course, all of this is what would happen if the animal source fertilizer would really hit the fan, but in peacetime, the planes still have some other roles to play. For example, whenever the US president travels internationally, one E-4 Bravo always follows and lands either at the same airport or somewhere within about an hour of the president. On top of that, one of the planes is also often used when the US Secretary of Defense is traveling internationally. But note that NECAP is just the name of the program that these aircrafts are part of. The E-4 Bravo itself is referred to as the Advanced Airborne Command Post, or AACP, and when one of them are flying and operating actively, it's called the National Airborne Operations Center, or NAOC. As you can see, there are a lot of acronyms in this world. Now, I've actually mentioned these planes briefly in a previous video where I talked about the different military roles of the 747s, and in that video I also explained that the E-4s are actually older than the two VC-25 Alphas, which most of us probably refer to as Air Force One. Like the VC-25 Alphas, the E-4s are based on the airframe of the Boeing 747-200. There are four of them in use right now, and the first two were actually initially built as commercial 747-200s, but the airline that ordered them never took delivery of them. So these first two jets entered service in 1974 with the destination E-4 Alpha, and they weren't actually the first kneecap aircraft to exist. A fleet of specially modified KC-135 air refueling tankers had previously had that same role, but with the designation EC-135 Juliet. When these first two 747s assumed that role, they basically had the same equipment for their missions as the previous EC-135 Julius had used. But then the third, purpose-built aircraft came along, and it incorporated more improvements, including newer and better engines. The fourth jet got the designation E-4 Bravo thanks to even more improvements, including that extra smaller hump on its back. That hump basically is a fairing for satellite antennas, and later the 
other three aircraft were upgraded to match the E4 Bravo specifications. In their final form, the E4 Bravos are truly impressive and even have the ability to withstand an EMP or electromagnetic pulse from a nuclear explosion. They also incorporated various defensive systems with countermeasures against missiles and obviously we have no idea about almost anything there, but because these aircraft need to be able to withstand an EMP, things like their cockpit avionics reportedly remain analog, which is much like the steam gauges that the original 747-200s always had. And obviously that's because newer digital stuff may be less capable to withstand those EMPs, or maybe it's simply just costing too much to make newer avionics tough enough to, to withstand that. So why change them if the older stuff is still working, I guess. But finally, as I explained in that previous video, these aircraft have what must be the world's longest flying antenna. A cable that, when fully extended, can be 5 miles or 8 kilometers long, allowing the planes to send messages to submarines literally on the other side of the planet. Now all of this is quite impressive, but 1974, when these planes entered service, was 49 years ago, and the first upgraded E4 Bravo already flew in 1978. 45 years ago. Now I'm sure that more upgrades here and there have probably been done to them over the time, but no matter how you see it, these planes have been long overdue for replacement. The Air Force have actually previously launched programs to replace the E-4 Bravo several times, but unsuccessfully so far. The Boeing 767 was for example the subject to one of these earlier plans, and the idea there was to use the same platform for several different roles, including air refueling, and airborne radar, as well as everything that the E-4 Bravo fleet today can do. But that obviously didn't happen. The US Air Force instead got a 767-based tanker called the KC-46, and a 737 platform for the airborne radar to replace the AWACS. It is also pretty clear that the replacements to the E-4 Bravos can't be either a 767 or a 737, because the Air Force really want the replacement to have four engines. Now, a project to provide an aircraft with a role as vital as this is quite prestigious for any aircraft manufacturer, similar to making the country's next presidential plane, the Air Force One. So Boeing's elimination from this process seems, well, a bit strange to say the least, no? So what's actually going on? Are Boeing not up to the challenge or is there something else going on here? Well, it turns out that it's a bit complicated, but I will explain all of it after this. Are you enjoying all of these super detailed videos that I'm making? The reason I'm asking is because if you do, you should definitely check out today's sponsor, CuriosityStream, which I'm so happy to welcome back. Curiosity Stream is the ultimate place to watch award-winning documentary films, shows and series that you won't find anywhere else. A great example, which I think that you guys will really like, is Supersonic, The Great Adventure, which I just finished. It's a documentary about high-performance supersonic fighter jets and the latest NASA developments, which was just seriously super cool. But if you like a break from aviation, then Curiosity Stream also covers science, nature, history, technology, military history, music, food. Well, you get the idea. There's definitely something for everyone. And the best part is, it's super affordable, with plans starting for less than $5 per month. On top of that, they also offer either monthly or annual plans, depending on what fits your wallet. So if you want to try this out for yourself, then go to curiositystream.com slash mentor now or scan this QR code. This will give you access to the world's top documentaries. And if you use the promo code mentor now, it will give you an awesome 25% discount on the annual subscription. So go to curiositystream.com slash mentor now and save 25% right now. Thank you CuriosityStream, now back to the video. To replace the E-4 Bravo fleet, the US Air Force eventually launched another program with yet another acronym, the Survivable Airborne Operations Center, or SAOC. The full details of this program are laid out in something called a System Requirement Document, or SRD, and big surprise, they are all classified. But a broad description of the project has been publicized, so we know that the Air Force expects the new platform to be about the same size as the existing E-4 Bravos. 
And to make sure that the development of this project doesn't take forever, they also expect bidding companies to use second-hand commercial airliners as the platforms for the project. Now, that's quite important because the type of aircraft that the Air Force wants for this role isn't really being produced anymore. You see, the Air Force insists that the new doomsday planes must still have four engines for reasons that have to do with redundancy but also with survivability. Now, you regular viewers of this channel will know that today twin-engine aircraft are constantly spanning the world's oceans perfectly safely because their engines are so reliable. But maybe unsurprisingly, the military has some quite different requirements. For example, a military aircrew on a mission might actually need to keep the jet in the air even after losing one engine, something that we in the commercial airline world would generally not do. We instead tend to divert to an airfield immediately if we would lose an engine. So to recap, we know that the replacement of the E4 Bravos will 1. be a similar size to the current place, 2. it should be a modification of an existing aircraft which can be produced relatively quickly and 3. it should have 4 engines. Obviously then, using existing already built airliners makes sense because neither the 747 nor any other commercial airliner with 4 engines is currently being produced. Some other aircraft might theoretically be acceptable, but the point here is that whoever wins this competition will almost certainly have to find and modify a fleet of moderately used Boeing 747s, most likely the latest Dash 8 model to cover all of those points. So the most obvious question here is, how could Boeing lose this contract? After all, the 747 is their design. Well, the short answer to this is that Boeing didn't exactly lose it. You see, Boeing knew that their Air Force had one or two key conditions in this contract which they just refused to meet. And to understand what that means, we need to have a look at the way that Boeing has been handling these type of military contracts in the past. One of the bigger ones that the company has taken in over the past few years is the presidential VC-25 Bravo, aka the next Air Force One, as well as the KC-46 Alpha tanker. Boeing is also right now constructing the Starliner spacecraft for NASA, which technically isn't military, but it falls on the Boeing's defense and space side of the business. And what all of these three programs have in common is that, well, they have all been serious headaches for Boeing and have cost them a mountain of money. To win the contracts for all three of them, Boeing agreed to a fixed price for each one, which means that any unforeseen costs that might arise during the development would have to be covered directly by themselves. Now, I am simplifying things here a little bit because contracts like these come in phases and not all of these phases have rigidly fixed prices, but the point is that these fixed price development contracts can really catch out the manufacturer, especially if the bidding process gets a bit, well, competitive. Boeing learned this the hard way when they competed against Airbus for the contract to construct a new aerial refueling tanker. Boeing eventually won that contract after quite a protracted battle, but with the benefit of hindsight, this wasn't such a resounding victory after all. You see, the initial fixed price development contract for the program was $4.9 billion, and so far, Boeing has recorded charges adding up to around $6.8 billion for it. But of course, that's not the whole story here. This is a huge contract and its total cost for the Air Force will be over 50 billion in the end. So Boeing will still make money from the KC-46 tankers just because of the sheer numbers of sales, which likely will be as high as around 176 in the US and then on top of that, foreign deals. But the situation is a lot harder for Boeing's accountants to motivate when it comes to more specialized projects for fewer aircraft or spacecraft like the Starliner. According to Reuters, Boeing has lost over $16 billion on fixed price development programs since 2014, and it seems like they are keen to show their investors that they are learning from those mistakes. So when it comes to the Survivable Airborne Operations Center, or SAOC, which will replace the Doomsday E-4 Bravos, Boeing confirmed that the US Air Force eliminated them from the selection process, and on top of that they stated, we are approaching all new contract opportunities with added discipline to ensure we can meet our commitments and support the long-term health of our business. 
And speaking to Boeing's investors, Brian West, Boeing's chief financial officer, had specifically said that the company hasn't signed any fixed price development contracts, nor do they intend to do that in the future. But one really interesting thing here is that it looks like Boeing doesn't necessarily think that it's all over for them in the story. Because in their most recent announcement, they also added we remain confident that our SAOC approach is the most comprehensive, technically mature and lowest risk solution for the customer and for Boeing. And that looks suspiciously like a bit of a hint and maybe even a dig at their competitor. But the obvious question then becomes, if they are the lowest risk solution, then who is the alternative? Who else could possibly find and then modify a fleet of 747s or other large four-engine jets to make them suitable for this program? Well, the full list of bidders for this contract is again unsurprisingly classified, but one company that we do know is bidding to do this is Sierra Nevada Corporation. They were previously described as the underdog in this competition, but with Boeing gone, well, officially at least, maybe these guys have become the top dogs now. Sierra Nevada Corporation might not be very well known publicly, but they have been a contractor for a number of military and security related projects ever since they were founded back in 1963. Among their most recent programs are the rocket motors for Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2, but they've also done quite a bit of work for SpaceX, Jeff Bezos Blue Origin, as well as many many others. A slightly less known but very promising vehicle that they are developing as their own project, not as a contractor, is the Dream Chaser, a space vehicle for NASA. That's a lifting body design that hopefully will carry people and cargo to and from the International Space Station eventually. Sierra Nevada already have a pretty large complex in Dayton, Ohio, and last summer they finished building a new hangar, which forms part of their bid for the Air Force's SAOC program. It is their fourth hangar in that facility, with an area of 90,000 square feet or 8,360 square meters, making it comfortably large enough to fit Boeing 7478s. The company has stated that they have the funds to participate in this Air Force bid on its own, which is no small achievement if it's true, because the Air Force expects that this program is going to have a total cost of $8.3 billion, which is a pretty high bill even for a program like this. Now one detail that I haven't mentioned yet, which might explain this high price tag, is the number of new aircraft that the Air Force wants in this deal. Like I said before, a total of 4 E-4 Bravos were ever made, all of which are still flying today. But for the next program, the Air Force wants 8 to 10 of these new aircraft instead. We don't really know the details behind this decision, but it appears that the Air Force expects that it will need to fly this next doomsday plane more frequently, perhaps even constantly, just like they did with its EC-135 Juliet during the Cold War. Of course, this means that whoever wins this contract will have to shop around for up to 10 747-8 passenger airliners, then buy them before they can even start the conversions. And here, it's important to know that Boeing have reportedly already told the Air Force that they have identified the necessary aircraft in order to do this. Like I said, I'm not so sure that they're really out of this yet. Sierra Nevada haven't actually confirmed that they will use 7478s, despite building a hangar big enough to fit one. But the company has confirmed that they have selected the aircraft type that they plan to use and that they've also submitted that to the Air Force. All of this is important, because in previous contracts involving existing airliner designs, the US Air Force have insisted that the aircraft needs to comply with FAA certification requirements for new types, which became a huge and very expensive problem for Boeing in the case of the next Air Force One. And that's because, as I explained in that older video, Boeing had to reposition about 250 miles or 400 kilometers of wiring in the next Air Force Ones just so that they would comply with newer standards, which existing 747s didn't really have to comply with since their designs were grandfathered in. A new design needs a new certification and could therefore not use those grandfathered rights, and that's what's going on. And of course, after all of that rewiring had been done, they also had to fit all of the new wires that all of the new systems in Air Force One would need to have. The next doomsday planes will certainly have a lot of new systems with their own wiring needs, which would have to be taken into account. So 
this contract might well face exactly the same type of issue. But the thing here is that those systems will be different from the ones that are different on Air Force One, so Boeing wouldn't be able to modify the Doomsday planes in the same way as they did with the next Air Force One, to save time and money. Now, one interesting detail here about Sierra Nevada Corporation is that, as a contractor, they specialize in testing and developing modifications and additions of systems in existing aircraft, even without the original manufacturer's participation. That could come in really handy for this kind of work that the Doomsday 747 involves, but we don't know what experience the company has in performing this work when the FAA is in charge. Of course, we also don't actually know if the US Air Force will still want the FAA to rubber stamp the certification of these planes, like they did with the Air Force One, and if they drop that requirement, well, then this will be a much easier affair. One way or another, the Air Force wants to award this contract early in 2024, or at least that's what the analysts expected to happen last summer. And unless that timeline changes, it might well be that Boeing is out of this program for good, and they might just be happy with that. Again, this is a very cloak and dagger program, so we don't even know if Sierra Nevada is the only company remaining in this competition at the moment, or maybe someone else, like Airbus is there? <laughs> but as for Boeing, what do you guys think? Is this a case of Boeing failing to meet the Air Force's standards or is Boeing actually being quite sensible here? I'd love to hear what you think. Put your comments into the comment section below. And also, can you think of any other aircraft that would work as a doomsday plane instead of the 747? This is definitely something that I will discuss with my Patreons on my next Patreon Zoom Hangout. And I would love to see you there as well. Thank you all for watching, I love having you here and don't forget to subscribe and maybe even send a super thanks or buy a t-shirt. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.